Okay, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, this week we have Jorge Krokov, uh, who's now at Stanford, going to tell us about his work on TTBAR and ADS2 and quantum mechanics. Jorge, thank you so much for getting up early to give this talk, and uh, the floor is yours, so take it away. Thank you, Ro. Um, yeah, it's, it's really nice to do this once, uh, this, this virtual seminar, see how that goes. It's indeed a bit early here. Like I, I woke up at uh, 5.45, get on the bike and, and went, went to, to the Institute. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's, let's talk a bit about uh, some things that I've been recently interested in. Um, so it's related to the TT bar deformation. I guess last week you, uh, you guys at the seminar from uh, Eva, so she, she talked a bit about TT bar and the sitter and that. Um, here I'm gonna talk actually a bit more about uh, just a lowest dimensional uh, case, which is to try to incorporate all these ideas of TT bar um, that we had in ADS3, CFT2 to, um, to ADS2 and to, to quantum mechanics theories, to, to especially the Schwarzschild theory as we'll see. And um, so in, in last July, we had a paper with uh, David Gross, Edgar Zhiguli, and Andrew Rolf, uh, on which this, this talk will be based, and some uh, work in progress that, that touches more on more general types of TT bar type deformations, um, but also um, a way to, to solve the theory exactly. So or given the initial theory, um, um, I'll be able, or we will be able to uh, to find any observable in the form theory. So we have a lot of calculational power, so that's, that, that's cool. Um, so let me first start with um, a bit of history and, and motivation. Maybe Eva already did that, but let me just do it again. Oh, this doesn't work. Oh, I like that. Okay, good. Um, so... It start, it, it all, this whole TT bar business starts its life in uh, 2004 when Zomolochikov uh, argues that uh, a particular combination of stress sensors in two dimensional uh, quantum field theories, the determinant of T in, in particular, which is just a particular contraction of, of T and T, um, and he shows that it is uh, that it factorizes in, in translation invariant states, as I've shown in equation one. So um, the um, the determ if you if I compute the expectation value of the determinant in some translation invariant state, I can write it just as a product of of one point functions in the combination I showed in figure one, in, in equation one, uh, and here theta is the trace of t. Um, so t is t z z and t bar is t z bar z bar, um, and and with with this at hand. Um, a lot of um, uh, say say now I add this determinant of t to 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 an action, then um, in fact a lot of things become um, calculable because of this factorization property. So in particular, um, what what was usually studied, uh, what was studied by Zamolochikov and also by Zamolochikov and Smirnov later is that if I consider a flow equation of the form two. Um, where I continuously change the action, the Euclidean action, um, by adding determinants of t. Um, and t here on the, on the right-hand side is the t corresponding to the deformed theory. And, and so this is really a non-trivial differential equation that, that sets off a particular flow in theory space. And... Um, the interesting thing about this particular flow is that given some initial spectrum of the, the what I will be calling the seat theory, um, so that will be the theory where lambda goes to zero, lambda is my coupling, it's in dimension minus two uh, coupling constant. Um, and as a and I, if I consider this flow too, given the initial spectrum, I can find, for example, the deformed spectrum, the deformed theory. Um, uh, non perturbatively in, in this parameter, lambda. Um, and there's many more things that become calculable, uh, and we'll see some examples later on. Now, this, this whole TT bar business uh, took off uh, even more in, in, um, in 2016. So this is way later 
um, when Maguth, Felinda, and uh, Metze show that if you add this TT bar deformation, um, so you consider this flow equation for a holographic CFT, um, then for a particular sign of this, um, of this parameter lambda, uh, you can think of this as um, um, a an, an, an deformation that imposes Dirichlet boundary conditions in ADS3. So um, in the usual du double trace story, this particular uh, double trace flow equation, so to say, um, puts, um, is, is dual to Dirichlet boundary conditions inside ADS3 at some finite radius uh, r equal rc, and that rc is then related in, in, in this way to, to lambda. Um, and so that was, that was from there on, and a lot of interesting uh, developments um, have followed. Um, for example, people realized that um, there was a relation to, to string theory, um, mostly because the, the deformed spectrum, we'll see the deformed spectrum later on, the deformed spectrum has, has a lot of features that you also find in, in string theory. And um, so Kutasov had a, and, and um, Aki Hashimoto have a lot of papers and give you on, um, on on that relation. Recently, we also put out a paper on, on a relation to string theory uh, in a slightly different setting. There have been generalizations to how to do this in, in higher dimensions, um, uh, how to do this um, for the sitter, which I think you heard about uh, last week a lot. Um, and, and another interesting development related to that is that you can think of the TT bar deformation as, as coupling the, the seed QFT or seed CFT to a particular um, type of gravity theory. And, um, and so in, in, in that sense, these are kind of very new type theories where, where you have a, some sort of coupling, uh, coupling to, to gravity. Um, which um, which even persists in, in, in the 1D D case, and, and which I'll hope to, to, to tell you a little bit about. Um, so, yeah, the, the plan of today is to apply these um, TT bar deformations in 2D um, to, to quantum mechanics and, and, and JT gravity. Or, uh, if you wish, we can, we can even do this for general dilaton uh, gravities. Um, and, and there are a few, few motivations for, for doing this. Uh, um, I told you a little bit about uh, a few motivations. One of them is, so, so in, in, um, in two dimensions, there, there exists interesting uh, bulk geometries, because I can consider a wild range of, of different dilaton gravities, so I can cook up various different um, um, space times. If I have the, the the equation of motion for the metric, is very simple, um, or for the for the dilaton actually, it's very simple. And um, one of them is where um, I have an asymptotically ADS two region uh, at some large radial distance, and then deep inside uh, the interior of this geometry, there is a, there's actually a, a DS two piece of uh, DS two, a static patch of of the sitter, and um, so, so these these interesting geometries now could be um, we could maybe try to understand using these geometries um, to understand what what say holography means in in DS two. So yeah, I'm imagining here that I have some initial theory at, at asymptotically uh, ADS two in that region, and which I flow inside the bulk using this this analog of the TT bar deformation. Um, for the more I, I told you about uh, the fact that there's more calculational power, obviously, because it's quantum mechanics and, and everything is, is pretty simple. Um, and and, and that, that additional calculational power also helps us to, um, to understand some, some things about higher dimensions. Um, for example, um, it, it, it teaches us a little bit how we can think of correlation functions in, in the deformed theory. There have been some works, uh, especially by, by, by Cardi in, in July of June or June, where he considers correlation functions in this TT bar deformation, in this TT bar deformed theories. And, and with this 
the ideas that I'm going to tell you about uh, here, um, we might be able to to do an analogous story in higher dimensions where where these these correlation functions are also obtained in in, in a cube way. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there there's many more interesting uh, interesting things we can uh, we can think of why we want to do this. Um, but yeah, for me, those are those are kind of the the main uh, the main things. Um, so uh, the plan is basically to to I want to very quickly show you what the deformation looks like in um, uh, in quantum mechanics, and I'll be just doing that using a dimensional reduction. Uh, this is a, this is a simple and, and quick way to see what the deformation is. Um, then I'll, I'll show from the gravity side um, that this corresponds to JT gravity at finite cutoff. Um, and, and then I'll go back to quantum mechanics and, and, and we'll, we'll play around with, with, uh, with the Schwarzschild theory and see how, that, how we can move that Schwarzschild theory in the bulk. Uh, any questions or comments? You guys can hear me, right? We can hear you, yeah. No questions from Paulson, at least. If other okay. people online have questions, feel free to just unmute your mic and, um, and speak up. No, I, I do have a question, actually. Oh. Uh, so, so, so in these considerations, especially if you think about the motivation number one, um, what, what you discussed before are states that are translation invariant, uh, states that are defined in Minkowski uh, space, say, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Do, do you yeah, have something to say about states defined in curved geometry? So, yeah, so the, um, uh, currently there's some efforts, uh, especially here from people in Stanford, to, to try to define the TT bar deformation on, on curved spaces. Um, and, and there seems to be, again, some sort of factorization uh, property emerging, even in those curved spaces. <clears throat> So yeah, currently, currently the um, the only thing we know how to do is, is the plane, uh, a cylinder, and the torus, um, and these are of course all very simple geometries. Yeah. Um, do, do, these, do these results that you're uh, saying uh, assume large C, or they're they're meant to be universal? Similar. No, they're not. They're not assuming large C. No. Okay. I mean, if, yeah. If you want to compare to the to the bulk, yeah, then then of course large C. But in in principle, this factorization property just holds independent of what C is. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, so I told you I wanted to do just a simple thing uh, using a dimensional reduction um, and. Um, so I'm going to consider a 2D, uh, I mean, I'm deriving the deformation here um, and um, the C theory I will be considering is, is something like the Schwarzschild theory or some, some quantum mechanics theory. So I'm not really literally dimensional reducing the, the CFT. I just want to see what combination of stress tensor or what a, in the 1D case is just a, a scalar and, and other components would be, would be present. Um, so I'll have a metric that is just d tau square plus d phi square. I set the radius of the circle uh, to one. And um, so in that case, the, the flow equation, this determinant of t, um, now has this particular uh, component, as I've written in equation three. And, and the most right side is, is, is in explicit, uh, explicit coordinates. And, and the point is, is that if I want to do a dimensional reduction um, or at least get integrate over the, the phi direction, um, then this T phi phi um, is kind of a problematic piece in this, in this equation and, or problematic. It will just be some different operator in the, in the 1D theory. And so, so I will call that uh, T phi phi. Uh, in the 1D theory, I'll call that O. Uh, and later we will see that this O is, is related to, um, you know, on the gravity side, to, to an operator dual to the dilaton. So they'll have a nice interpretation uh, in that case. And um, for simplicity, I'll just, <clears throat> oh yeah, so this T tau phi is an, um, 
you can think of that in the 1D theory as a, as a conserved charge, um, which is just the, the momentum in, in, in 2D, uh, and that just becomes a an, um, conserved charge in the 1D theory. I'll actually consider, uh, just for the moment, cases where this t tau phi is zero, um, uh, and then the deformation will, uh, in the 1D case, I can now integrate over this phi, and, and I'll get uh, a flow equation that looks like equation four. And this, this is the flow equation I'll be, um, this is a simple derivation of, of what this flow equation is. Of course, it's kind of useless in this, in this form because um, we don't really know in the quantum mechanics what this O is. Um, so so we'll, we'll, we'll rewrite this equation in a minute. Um, but I should also note that this particular um, uh, flow equation, you can also derive from, from the gravitational side by, by looking at a, um, like the Vila de Witt equation in, in 3D in, in 2D uh, JT and, and decomposing the metric in some sort of radial, uh, radial ADM decomposition. Um, I will not do that here in this talk. Um, but um, yeah, you're more than happy to uh, ask questions about it, and we can uh, we can talk about it um, later, or you can look it up in the paper. Um, so the starting point now will be equation four, and I want to rewrite this O a little bit. And remember, this O was T phi phi in two D theory. And now the curious thing is is that um, uh, this this T phi phi is actually related to T tau tau in a very uh, intricate way using the, the so-called trace relation. And in, in the bulk, this relation is, uh, is a Hamilton constraint. And uh, I mean, this is just a rewrite of the, the Hamilton constraint in terms of the Brown-York stress tensor, for example. Um, and on the other hand, you can also think about this in, in the field theory as um, so, the the right hand side comes from um, uh, comes from the the flow equation. For example, equation three that will be the the flow equation. It's multiplied by by lambda. So I'm taking a lambda d lambda of the Euclidean action, uh, and that gives me this this right hand side of equation five. And then the trace of t is a, is another way of saying that um, say I have one dimensional uh, scale. Uh, this lambda, then if I take uh, lambda d lambda of the Euclidean action, um, I should get the trace of the stress tensor. <clears throat> and so assembling these two, you'll, you'll arrive at an equation of the form five. And um, so if I write out this, this equation now in terms of, of components and solve for t phi phi in terms of t tau tau, um, I get an equation uh, six. And now, so six is basically the form of this O. And I should note that this is more of an, an on-shell relation, like equation five is more a, is an Hamilton constraint in, in the bulk. Or said differently, you're, you're really taking derivatives of log Z. Um, and, and so um, here I'm kind of using an on-shell relation to rewrite the deformation. Um, and, and the deformation that we'll, we'll end up with is, is equation seven. So, so this looks a lot different than, than what we had in, in, in two dimensions. Um, but, but actually it's, 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 the natural, it's a natural object to, to consider and has some nice properties and that we'll see um, um, during the talk. Um, so just a few comments about this particular uh, operator. Um, yeah, so the first comment is that um, if you do a Hamiltonian analysis of JT gravity, say do some radial slicing of, of the bulk, then you'll, you'll actually find that this operator O is, is the operator dual to the dilaton. And this is just because in higher dimensions, um, the extrinsic curvature is related to the stress tensor, but in, um, in, in JT, um, the extrinsic curvatures are actually related to, um, to, to this operator dual to the dilaton. 
You can just see that because you have an R phi term. And if I now take a phi derivative, um, um, and, and the boundary term is like phi times k minus one, then you'll see that if I take this phi derivative, that, um, that I get k. Um, and so the operator O is really like right. can, can, I, can, I, can I interrupt for a moment? Can, can you once again uh, repeat like uh, how you arrive uh, at equation seven? It seems important and um, I'm a bit confused about it. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. so let's go back. Um, so I'll start with equation four. Yeah. Which I got from, from, uh, from equation three and I integrate it uh, over the phi direction. So this is just a pure one day um, um, equation. You're happy with equation four? Yeah, that, that's clear, yeah. Okay, so then this, this, um, this O, remember, is T phi phi. So as I say, above equation phi, O is T phi phi, and now, um, one more question. So you did one integral over over angle because it's trivial. It just gives you two pi or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I, I just yeah, exactly. That just cancels on both sides. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So now five. Sorry. So let's move to five. An integral over five. Yeah, that's oh, right. Equation five. Oh, sorry. Equation five comes from, um, it's called the trace relation. It comes from either, in the bulk, you can think of it as the Hamilton constraint, which is like the radial radial component of Einstein's equation, or the, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, the, the, the Hamilton is, yeah, let's just call it the Hamilton constraint in, in the bulk of JT, um, or in the, in the bulk of uh, ADS3. Um, um, and another way to see that is is by um, looking at um, so the right hand side is is equation three multiplied by minus lambda. And if I have a dimensional uh, dimensionful scale in the problem, and I take um, um, a derivative um, of the Euclidean action of or the log z of that um, with respect to that uh, parameter I get the stress tensor right if I have lambda d lambda of uh, Euclidean action I'll arrive at, at t again okay the trace of t uh, with some factors um, um, and when you assemble that you get you get a relation uh, that's like equation five okay. happy Yep. Um, now that equation I'm, I'm using to rewrite uh, T phi phi <coughs> in terms of T tau tau. And here I, I, I ignored again this T tau phi component. Okay. And now if I plug in this equation six um, in, um, in what I had in equation four, right? Oh, I plug in what I, what I'm now writing in equation six, I arrive at equation seven, where um, t tau tau upper lower is is like is is t. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. So yeah, equation seven will be will be our our, our starting point uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, so yeah, this always the operator dual to the dilaton. Um, the nice thing about this this operator seven in in, in quantum mechanics is that uh, t is like the Hamiltonian, um, and and so any energy eigenstate will, I mean, this operator will factorize in any energy eigenstate. So this this whole factorization property that you have to be very careful about in, in higher dimensions. This uh, this only yeah this comes for free in the in the quantum mechanics. And so especially you can consider much more general deformations that, that might have an interesting application um, in, in, in one way or another. Um, and, um, but I'll mostly focus on this particular one. And so the other thing is, is that there seems to be a pull um, when, when the energy or the expectation value of T is one over four lambda. 
And, and we'll see that this corresponds to this kind of common feature in all these TT bar different theories um, is that at some point these energies will complexify. And, and from the bulk point of view, that has a totally natural interpretation, um, which I will get to uh, shortly. Um, and let's, let's just first consider what, what those energy levels um, in the deformed theory will look like. So I had this equation seven, and this is easily translated into uh, a flow equation for the, for the energy. You have to do a little bit work to, to show that it's, um, that seven equals this equation uh, eight. Um, but, but, but it turns out that, that the flow equation for, for the energy levels or the, even the Hamiltonian is, is very simply given by, by, by equation uh, eight. And now this, this can be solved and, and gives you a solution of the form nine. And, and this is kind of the, the typical type energy levels that you have in this TT bar deformed theories. So there, there's some square root um, and um, the square root um, vanishes um, exactly at this, um, um, or when this, this root is zero, the energy is exactly this one over four lambda that I, that I talked about um, uh, before. Um, and so when, when E naught, um, when this, the vanishing of this root at some point, this this um, this root becomes complex, and that's exactly when when the energy um, um, is one over four lambda plus some extra imaginary uh, part. Um, so that 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 explains that that pole as well. Um, and the interesting thing here is 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 because of quantum mechanics, the um, we can even conclude that that the Hamiltonian that we can just replace E with, with the Hamiltonian. So I don't have to talk about expectation values. I can just talk directly about the deformed Hamiltonian. And this is kind of special for, for, um, for quantum mechanics um, because in, in these particular deformations that I'm considering, the, uh, um, which is basically sending the Hamiltonian to another function of the Hamiltonian, these eigenfunctions do not, do not change. And, and so a lot of things uh, simplify uh, dramatically. Um, and, and this equation 10 will be, will be useful later on, uh, again, when we will consider um, uh, deforming the Schwarzschild theory. Um, okay, so that was kind of the, the quick way of getting this, this, um, this deformation and, and learning about the, the energy levels in the deformed uh, quantum mechanics theory. Um, now I want to like switch gears a little bit and, and go to the gravitational side of the story and show that the energy levels nine with an appropriate identification for lambda and E naught are um, those that you get from say putting a ADS2 black hole um, in, a, in a box, in a, in a box of finite size, uh, finite radius. So yeah, before I go there, any questions about, about this? and uh, quantum mechanics deformation. All right, let me go on. Um, so the gravity theory I will consider is JT gravity, and I'll parameterize the bulk metric um, in, in, a, in a radial, um, like in some sort of a radial um, ADM decomposition. Here I ignored the, 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 the shift that you usually have, like off diagonal components or the, um, and, and only kept the, the laps, which is just GRR. Um, so the, the action of JT is the familiar one uh, written in equation 12. Um, we have uh, phi, which is the diloton, uh, and its equational motion sets the metric, or the curvature of the metric equal to minus two. Um, and, um, um, yeah, so those are the, the main players in this, in this action. And then I, I dropped uh, the topological piece. So this, this S naught that um, other groups here in Stanford are very excited about, I dropped that here. Um, and um, yeah, so I included also the Gibbons, Hawk, York uh, boundary term is phi times K. 
And um, I also put in a boundary uh, counter term uh, phi to, to make the on-shell action finite. And uh, yeah, what I now want to do is, is um, put de declare boundary conditions um, on the metric and the dilaton at some finite radius uh, r equal rc. So the, the picture that I have in mind is the, is the following. Um, so there's this gray circle. Um, um, so it's, I'm just Euclidean now. So this, this uh, gray circle is the asymptotic ADS2 boundary. And um, what I want to do is put Dirichlet boundary conditions at this red circle at radius r equal rc. And um, I'll be denoting, uh, so phi naught will be phi at rc, and uh, g naught will be um, rc squared gamma tau tau at, RC, at, at the radius uh, rc. And um, from this Hamiltonian, uh, from, sorry, from this, this action, I can also deduce what the Brown York stress tensor is um, and the canonical momentum of the dilaton. So um, I wrote these in equation 13. So <clears throat> T tilde is the Brown York stress tensor. And O tilde is the canonical momentum of the dilaton. And, and you'll see how, how these are, are derived um, using functional derivatives of the on shell action. Um, and these tildes here are there because um, these are not quite the field theory variables yet. So there is a particular dictionary that, that, that we proposed with, with Tom Hartman some time back of how to translate between bulk variables and field theory variables. Um, and, and that's why I kept the, the tildes. Um, I, will, I will talk about this dictionary in, in, in just a moment. Um, Right, so now that we know a little bit about what I want to do in this, uh, in this gravity theory and put Dirichlet boundary conditions, um, let's, let's now look at uh, a black hole. Uh, so imagine that this, this black dot that I drew there is, of course, suggestive for a black hole. Um, and, and in JT gravity, there's, there's black hole solutions as well. And uh, the metric and dilaton uh, are given as in equation 14. Uh, and so this, um, um, yeah, this is the, the form of the, of the metric and dilaton. And the dilaton has this particular uh, blow up close to, to the boundary where R goes to infinity. And, and the metric has a, has a, has a, a singular, has a, has a horizon precisely at R plus, uh, given in terms of these particular um, uh, quantities, <clears throat> g and m and phi r. So phi r is the r, the subscript r stands for renormalized, and that, that is uh, usually the, the, the piece of the dilaton that you'll see in the Schwarzschild action. So that will be the, component, the, the, uh, the coefficient of the, of the Schwarzschild action. Um, so now I want to compute this, this T tilde, um, um, and, and that's quite easily done using uh, that definition that I gave before. Um, and um, it takes this particular derivative, radial derivative of phi, um, and, um, um, and subtracts that from, from phi itself. So uh, nr here is a, is a normal derivative to, to the boundary, and because of I chose this particular um, radial decomposition with ignoring the, the lap of the shift and all that. Um, this nr is just um, the square root of the GRR component. Um, and, and phi itself is given as in, as in 14. So if I carry now out these, these particular derivatives and assemble them, I get this, um, I get equation 15. Now, equation 15 looks already a lot like what we saw before for these energy levels and the quantum mechanics. Um, but uh, notice that um, when I take RC to infinity, um, I get uh, the, this parameter M, which is usually called the mass of the, of the ADS2 black hole, um, over RC. So this, this quantity actually goes to, to, to zero at, uh, at infinity. 
and and this is where where I I need to introduce this dictionary now, is that I need to um, take off peel off appropriate powers of RC in order to get something finite um, and non-zero um, when I take this this RC parameter uh, to infinity, and this is just because I want to match on to the initial uh, theory uh, from the quantum mechanics point of view. Or this is also true in higher dimensions where, where this, this same thing happens. Um, so actually, so motivated by, by this particular uh, growth of the, um, uh, this t tau tau close to the, the boundary, um, I'll be motivating uh, a particular dictionary as written in, in 17, where um, so G0 is a bulk metric. And um, gamma tau tau is the, is the field theory, or the EFT, uh, just wrote this in more general language, but, but this should just be thought of the quantum mechanics metric um, at gamma tau tau, that's the, that's the quantum mechanics metric, then T tau tau without the tilde is the field theory um, uh, stress sensor, uh, phi r is, is, the, is the dilaton that appears in the, in the quantum mechanics and um, O is the, the operator um, that appears in, um, in, in, the, uh, in the quantum mechanics theory as well. That's this, I now see that I used no O, mathcal O here, but this is the same thing. Um, and, and I peeled off this particular powers just to get something finite. Uh, and so in particular, um, um, if I now compute the, the energy from, from the bulk point of view uh, and, and go through that dictionary 17, so I, I, um, this, this trace, I peel off this factor 1 over RC, I get, this met, I get an energy of the um, black hole solution that looks like equation 18. And now equation 18 um, can be, um, is exactly the form of the energy levels that we had before as well in the quantum mechanics. Um, but now um, I have to identify this parameter lambda with uh, one over something proportional to one over R C square, and E naught is uh, the mass. And so that's that's the usual identification. The second one is the usual identification, um, but the first one, the lambda is one over R C square, is kind of the the novelty of this um, moving inside the bulk. Um, so that's that's a way to uh, translate between now the field theory variables, this, this lambda and E naught, and and bulk variables, R C M and phi R. Um, right, and here, so now the, the the complexification of these energy levels has a nice bulk interpretation, as it means that if R C is, um, is 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 smaller. Uh, then R plus, then these energies will complexify, and that just means that the, your slice has gone into the um, into the black hole. And so this, and this is actually again more general in higher dimensions, um, and that again these energy levels will complexify as as long as uh, as soon as you're going into the when your slice dives into the black hole. All right. Um, let me make a few more uh, uh, comments uh, about this before leaving gravity again. Um, so this, this, this analysis that I told you about, about putting JT at finite cutoff in the bulk and, and, and figuring out what, what the correct dictionary is, um, that can actually be done uh, for general uh, dilaton gravities. So um, of course you need, you need dilaton gravities which have a particular uh, asymptotic region, say an ADS2 asymptotic region. Um, um, otherwise, this is going to be a bit hard, of course. But um, for, for all those particular dilaton gravities, um, um, you can derive a corresponding deformation and study that in the quantum mechanics, for example, and, and, and derive uh, various things from it. Um, and especially, this, this also helps uh, um, with the, the, the kind of centaur geometry that I showed way in the beginning, where you had a DS2 region inside uh, ADS2. And so with this formalism, you cannot imagine um, 
dissecting the the centaur by um, by cutting off this this AS2 region and um, flowing flowing that slice all the way down to the to the desitter region. Um, so that's one thing that you you can can do with this. Um, a more um, traditional point of view of of all this TT bar deformation, even in in in, in, in two dimensions is that um, instead of thinking about these dirich lab boundary condition, some finite radial cutoff, you can also think about this as um, setting up some mixed boundary conditions at asymptotic infinity. And, and this was first uh, pioneered by Monica Guica in a, in a recent, and Ruben Monten in a recent paper um, in, 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 in May or so. Um, and and it, it, this just follows the, the standard story of adding multi-trace deformations to, to, to ADS-CFT um, where, um, for example, in our case, you would add something like equation 20, this O times T or this T square uh, divided by this, this particular numerator. Um, and um, yeah, so th that's a kind of an analogous way of thinking about these, these deformations. Um, and, and it might, might also be much more well-defined uh, quantum mechanically, just putting some different boundary condition at, at infinity. Um, and, and yeah, classically that then corresponds to, um, to putting the boundary conditions at some finite radius. I won't go too much in, the, uh, in, in this direction, but, um, but that's sure a thing that you should have in, in mind when you think about these, these particular TT bar deformations. Um, and because we're in quantum mechanics, there's a, there's actually a much wider class of deformations that you that you can consider, um, because factorization kind of comes for free. There's no space, so there there can't be any uh, annoying uh, uh, divergences and and things like that. And so, in fact, you can consider deformations that are functions of O and T or just uh, T. And, and, and on the quantum mechanics side, these are all well-defined. And um, you might wonder why, why do we want to do this? Um, and, and that's certainly a good question. I mean, yeah, there has to be a well-defined reason why uh, you want to study this more generally. But um, there's some interesting things you can imagine, like in SYK, for example, the, um, um, you, could, you could say, oh, how can I change SYK or deform SYK so that it has like a clean um, uh, JT gravity in, in the IR. So um, you can consider a deformation that gaps out all these higher spin modes uh, that you would usually have. Um, and, um, and then you'll, you'll have an, an, a model that, that has a very clean uh, JT gravity in, in the IR. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's, that's one motivation of studying more larger classes of deformations. Um, so now I want to go back to, to, to quantum mechanics. So I'll leave gravity uh, for, for what it is. Um, um, it gave us some clue about what the deformation is, but, but now I want to move on to, um, to, to quantum mechanics again. So if there's questions, so yeah, now it's maybe a good time for questions about gravity or this JT, sorry. So, so Jorn, we have at least one question here in Boston. Um, so um, when you move inside the, the black hole, which is equivalent to these energy levels becoming complex, yeah. do you still have theoretical control of the calculation or this is a total breakdown of, of, of this whole approach? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think we have we have control over that computation because I mean we can compute things, but um, yeah, then I mean we don't know what's going on inside inside the black hole, so maybe we're doing something weird. But given if this if this um, given this kind of classical picture, then yeah, we can we can do that. And, and 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 compute these things but from the from the quantum mechanics point of view it's the complexification of energies we're not sure uh what to do with it exactly like you can you can imagine like just chopping off the the spectrum at some 
at some high energy um, and um, and 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 called it an, an EFT or so. Like in quantum mechanics, it's um, it's very simple to do that. Uh, there's no space, and and so you can just truncate the matrix, uh, the Hamiltonian matrix, so to say. In higher dimensions, that becomes a bit more tricky. But since the deformation is non-local anyway, maybe you don't care. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's that's a good question about what what would the what the interpretation is of the complexification. Um, and, and, the, and these calculations that, 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 that you were discussing on the gravity side, they are done in the setting of one side of the black hole or only one side. So, 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 so what happens if you consider a thermal to double state? Like, uh, yeah, that, that's also a good question. Um, you, you, should, you should be able to do the thermal field double state in a, simple, in a similar analysis as, as we, do, we did. Um, Thing is that that we mostly worked um, just Euclidean, um, and and so our geometry is just this uh, this disk. Um, now, if you if you consider uh, this thermal field double state, um, and, and and consider like time, you can prepare a particular state in this in this cutoff geometry, and then evolve that. Um, yeah, we haven't we haven't studied that particular time evolution, but you, that's certainly something that you that you can do. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and yeah, you might imagine like, do these complexifications still happen in in the um, in, in in the thermal field double states? Like, uh, so my, my, my only my only motivation to do so was that while I was speaking that the the interior of the of the eternal black hole. Um, is is well somehow like it's better it's better defined if you have access to two copies, right? That's right. Yeah. No. I. I yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I think I think that's an interesting an interesting question. Like, uh, but that you you could also study um, in in higher dimensions or sure. in, in the two D two D case where you just take the, the thermal field double state indeed and 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 T T bar deform that. Um, in in the quantum mechanics case, um, I, I think I think I have a way of, of of understanding how this thermal field double state changes, and maybe we can we can see that when I discuss these the correlators in the deformed theory, they will give a clue about how this thermal field double state will, will change. For example, um, um, but yeah, I mean that, that's that's certainly an interesting uh, open question to to do and study time evolution in this uh, theory yeah. yeah thank you thank you uh, all right so back to quantum mechanics um, so the first thing you 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 want to compute about this the about a quantum mechanics theory is I guess its partition function so let's just um, Let's just follow the, the textbook here and try to compute some uh, some 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 things. Um, so the partition function in the form theory is given uh, as in twenty one. Um, here I've I've taken an uh, continue or I've take to, taken a particular density of states rho. Think of it. You can also think about it as some bunch of delta functions. Um, but later on, we'll consider Schwarzschild and that as a continuous spectrum. I'll, I'll stick to this more general form. Um, and this f of e is, is given uh, below. So that's the deformed energy levels. Um, now, this, this form 21 is completely useless. Um, can't do anything with that. So um, to make it a bit more useful, we're going to define a, a kernel, k, um, defined as an equation 22. So this, kind of, this kernel transforms the the usual Boltzmann factor, uh, e to the minus beta prime e, to uh, the Boltzmann factor we want, e to the minus beta f of e. And um, luckily for this particular deformation that we that we consider this f of e, um, we can find a closed form expression for this 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 k. And so this um, equation twenty three is um, is the is the kernel for the deformation um, and the holographic deformation? Let me refer to that the, that particular uh, deformation. So here, um, 
lambda is, is um, positive corresponds to the, the holographic uh, deformation. So the, in that when lambda is positive, I can identify it holographically with one over RC square, as we saw. Um, and um, for lambda negative, it's um, it's again a particular deformation, but it a priori has nothing to do with with holography. Um, and 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 this has a yeah. So this this kernel twenty three um, has a has a funny form, but it's it's almost Gaussian, um, and um, and and turns out to be like the key object to solving uh, the the deformed theory basically. Um, yeah, so the, the, the integral beta prime runs from, from zero to infinity here. And, and so what we end up with is um, an integral transform of the, um, uh, the original partition function that gives the, um, that gives the deformed partition function. Um, and so, so this is a much, much more useful uh, form of the, of the deformed partition function. Um, as it means that if I have the original um, partition function, I can compute the deformed partition function straight away. Um, of course, as I mentioned, the only lambda smaller than zero, then this exponential is suppressing, um, but, and, and um, we can define it, but for lambda bigger than zero, we can define it through analytic continuation. Um, it, that's again related to the fact that when lambda is positive, there will be these complexifications. And if you look at below equation 21, when lambda is positive, there will be complex energies. When lambda is negative, there won't be any complex energies. Um, and, and, and so the, um, uh, the deformation uh, is, is a bit more sane in that way. Um, but yeah, so, so this is the, the, the partition function um, in the form theory. We'll come back to this, this equation when we consider the Schwarzschild theory, when we have, where we have an explicit uh, expression for Gina. Um, and, but yeah, so that, that's, that's all I had to say about, about partition function, uh, really. Um, I'll say some more when we, when we consider the, an actual example, because that will be easier. Um, Using this 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 kernel k, um, we can actually like compute uh, any correlator as well, because I mean the only thing in, in what this deformation does is changing the the Boltzmann factor, right? I mean it's 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 just changing e to the mi uh, minus beta e to e to the minus beta um, f of e, and if I have a, a con controllable way of of how to translate between the two. Then I can I can in, in in principle solve the 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 entire theory given the original theory. Um, so in the deformed theory, the a two point function um, of two operators. Oh, this should not be confused with the operator O that I had written down uh, earlier. This is just some generic operator um, um, that that doesn't depend on on lambda in any way. Then um, this, this two-point function, the form theory will take that form 25. Um, the energy eigenstates are still the same. I mean, the, the Hamiltonian goes to a function of the original Hamiltonian. Um, and so there's not, not really anything uh, that can affect these eigenstates. They will all be the same. You can worry about non-perturbative things, but that, let's, not, let's not do that. Um, so, now I can again insert the, the, the kernel to get rid of this, uh, this, this annoying exponential factor. And what I'll end up with is, um, is an equation 26. Uh, and, and so again, I can, from using this kernel, I can get the uh, deformed, in this case, two point vacuum two point function from the original two point function. Um, and, and so in, in this sense, um, um, we've kind of solved the deformed the theory. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the only thing that you need to know is this kernel. And once you know the kernel in principle, you can just compute anything, um, anything you'd like. It might be complicated, but in principle, um, all the ingredients are there. Um, 
Right. A, a question here. Uh, do these formulas have a natural holographic interpretation in a sense, for example, 20, 26? Uh, can, one think about, can, can one think of the, uh, this kernel as something that interplays between the UV boundary and uh, the cutoff surface? Right. You, you mean some sort of HKLL type thing or yeah. something like that, right? Yeah. Um, this particular kernel is, is not quite like um, uh, HKLL. Like, um, yeah, there, there, you, you can, of course, um, let, let me think about this uh, a little bit. Um, I think it's certainly true that this this will somehow give you um, that it has the spirit of an HKLL uh, type uh, kernel. Um, although I'm, I'm not quite sure whether it's exactly the same one. Most of these expressions also um, really make sense for, for the, uh, the non-holographic sign, um, which, which is this lambda negative that I, that I stressed before. Um, when, when lambda is positive, you have to define it through analytic continuation. And um, I'm not sure whether this will exactly give you something in the uh, um, at finite cutoff. Of course, it kind of has to um, um, because, yeah, I mean, we're just doing some classical equation uh, in the bulk and demanding Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, However, to make that argument precise, I would need to put Dirichlet boundary conditions also on, uh, on the matter fields that these operators are dual to. Um, and, and that I haven't done in here. So perhaps in the HKL uh, thing, you, you would have to have like two kernels, right? That, that's true, yeah. So here I, I put one of these operators uh, at the origin. Um, and, and you'll ideally have two of these kernels. The only, the only thing I'm saying is that um, to do that thing, um, um, I mean, if you would have an interpretation of these, these O's living on that cutoff surface, you would need to um, put Dirichlet boundary conditions also on whatever matter field is dual to these O's. Right. So now I just put Dirichlet boundary conditions on the metric and the dilettante. And um, yeah, to, to have an HKLL type interpretation, I would need to put Dirichlet boundary conditions at the, uh, for the matter fields as well that are present because I have these O's. Right? Yeah. Um, and and that, that can be done. Um, and that will indeed give you some sort of HKLL uh, type, um, um, uh, yeah, type kernel. It's 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 a bit different though. Like for example, you can consider if I insert an operator at the at the Dirichlet wall, then um, somehow this corresponds to two operators at asymptotic infinity. Um, uh, because you're kind of focusing, say you do massless uh, matter in the bulk, and then you're kind of focusing two light rays onto that. Um, 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 yeah, you, there's like, okay, I don't have a blackboard here, but um, there's, there's um, if I draw, if I have the operator on the Dirichlet cutoff, and um, now draw, two light rays away from the Dirichlet wall, Dirichlet wall to the asymptotic boundary. So one goes to, to, to the future, one goes to the past. I naturally can associate two operators to the one operator I had in the, um, uh, on the Dirichlet wall. So that, that is kind of the, um, the kind of HKLL smearing uh, that, that you'll get in that case. Um, yeah. Um, um, you're, we've got about maybe five minutes left on the clock, by the way. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, 
So uh, yeah, let me then maybe move on to, uh, let's see, there's either one or two things I can do. Uh, let me just uh, skip this and let's move on to, um, so this world line thing is just a realization that you can uh, uh, study the, the, this kernel, you can rewrite that as some world line uh, action and so you're coupling the, uh, the, the, the quantum mechanics to a world line. And, and that can can you can work out what the what that coupling is and and how that what the partition function exactly looks like and you'll you'll get this uh, this kernel back again. Um, okay, so let's let's move on to a, to a particular uh, example. Uh, um, the, the Schwarzschild theory. So the Schwarzschild theory um, is given as in equation thirty one with with thirty two the familiar form of this derivative. Um, and, and now we would like to, um, so this will be one example of a theory that, um, uh, that, has a, that you can derive from, from, from JT gravity in a, in a particular way, uh, as Malasena, Yang, and Stanford uh, showed um, uh, very nicely. Um, and now we want to um, put this um, uh, as, our, as our initial theory and, and, and see what, what, the, uh, what the deformed uh, theory and hence the um, JT at finite cutoff uh, looks like. So what I want to do is use this equation 33, the Hamiltonian as a function of the initial Hamiltonian H naught. And what I need to, 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 to do is now to compute um, H naught. And the, uh, the initial Hamiltonian is the Schwarzschild, um, uh, the Schwarzschild action is given in 31. And that has uh, higher order derivatives. So I need to use this Ostrogratsky formalism to deal with this higher dimensional phase space. Um, <clears throat> and and, um, and one, one stupid question. Uh, why, why do you display in, in 32 like the first term if it's the total derivative? Yeah, so the total derivative, we, you, can, you can drop that uh, and we'll be dropping that. Oh, OK. So, so we shouldn't care about it. Yeah, we shouldn't, you shouldn't care about it. OK. Um, okay, so the um, um, you have to define multiple, uh, so two additional uh, momenta and, and, and coordinates to, to do this, uh, to write the Hamiltonian in canonical form. Um, when you go through the, the, the trouble, um, you'll get uh, equation 35 for the initial uh, Hamiltonian in terms of these momenta uh, pi and qi. Um, and um, here I've dropped the initial, uh, the, 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 the higher, uh, the, sorry, the total derivative. And um, when you now plug this back into this formula for, for H, the deformed Hamiltonian and the genre transform, you will get um, something that looks like equation uh, 36. Now, and, and 36 uh, might seem a bit complicated, um, but actually it, it is not that complicated. So notice that if, if lambda goes to, to zero, then this first term basically becomes a constraint where tau prime is equal to e to the phi. Uh, and, and if you plug that back into 30, the, the, the second piece in 36, uh, you'll recover the Schwarzschild action in the, in the Liouville variables. And so you have the exponential uh, potential uh, e to the two phi, and then there is um, and uh, there's a phi prime square. Um, if I if I now consider uh, just taking lambda finite and um, choose a different parametrization of e to the phi as e inverse times tau prime, um, then uh, what you'll get is the covariant version of of the Schwarzschild theory, um, and that's the second piece. And the first piece will actually be more, um, uh, will be this world line action that I, that I uh, didn't talk about, um, but mentioned uh, very briefly. So, so this action seems to be perfectly consistent with, with, with the other considerations. Uh, and you can also consider the, doing the Stanford Malasena Yang uh, procedure to higher orders. Um, um, and which would be more a, a bulk point of view of, of putting the JT theory at finite cutoff. 
Um, so in that procedure, you'll, you'll have this wiggly cutoff uh, on the boundary and um, you have particular boundary conditions as I wrote uh, below. And um, however, if you, if you do this particular uh, um, um, uh, yeah, if, if you consider uh, putting JT gravity at finite cutoff in this particular way, uh, you'll find that you'll get a different answer than what if you use the deformation that I've been talking about. And, and the reason is, is that um, we, we found this deformation using uh, bulk on-shell um, uh, equations. In particular, I used this, this, this Hamilton constraint to rewrite this O again. Um, and, um, um, and the Schwarzschild action is actually in an off-shell action. You haven't imposed a metric equation of motion in that case. Um, and, and so these two flows, uh, this Meltzer-Sena Stanford Yang procedure, and the, our deformation will actually result in something different on shell, but uh, of off shell, but but on shell there will again be an agreement. Um, so, for example, the, the partition function. <clears throat> say I want to compute the partition function, then the initial partition function takes a form thirty eight. Uh, with a density of states, which is this cinch. And um, in the deformed theory, um, I can write this, um, uh, I can come up with, with an expression for the uh, deformed um, uh, density of states, which you do just by relabeling re your uh, variables in a, in, a, in a clever way, and you'll get uh, a density of states for the deformation uh, that we've been considering. Uh, that looks like equation 40. And so here you see that, that there's a piece uh, up front that, that at some point goes negative, and that's where you, you have to cut off the spectrum, basically, um, to, to not allow these complex energies to enter. Um, <clears throat> for the, the sign where there's no, uh, no problems, no complexifications, you, can, you could also use the integral transform to compute the, the deformed partition function. And then it takes uh, this particular form. So this is uh, a Bessel K2. Uh, and notice here that if lambda is negative, which is the non-holographic sign, uh, there's actually a, a Hagedorn uh, divergence, which and the temperature of which depends on, uh, on, on one over root lambda. And the, um, um, this is kind of the typical thing uh, for, for these type of deformations. Um, that uh, that there is a particular Hagedorn type spectrum. You can also see that from equation 40, they take lambda to be negative and now send e uh, e to the infinity or e large. Then this goes like e to the uh, energy, and so you'll you'll have this Hagedorn uh, growth. And so you expect that there's some temperature where the partition function doesn't make sense anymore or diverges, uh, and that is exactly this, this particular temperature um, where the, the root inside the Bessel K uh, vanishes. Um, okay, so that was very quickly what this um, uh, deformed Schwarzschild uh, uh, theory uh, looks like. You can consider other observables as well. Um, um, for example, you could look at the OTOC, um, and, and consider um, scrambling uh, in these deformed theories, the Lyapunov exponent. Um, you can easily see that, that the Lyapunov exponent won't be affected. This can be seen either from the bulk, where um, putting this boundary closer in doesn't change the Lyapunov exponent, but will change the scrambling time because um, this, this cutoff surface is, is closer to the, to the black hole. And, um, and so that, that is also an, 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 an tractable computation you can do in, this, in these particular theories. Um, yeah, so let me, let me just uh, uh, conclude. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I showed you how to do JT gravity at finite cutoff and, and how to think about that as a, as a particular flow in, in, in the quantum mechanics. Um, we found a, a, a kernel that allows us to compute um, basically anything in the deformed theory, given uh, the full uh, theory, the full initial theory. 
Um, and so this is a very powerful uh, tool that I think also has some applications in higher dimensions that are, that are worth exploring. Uh, and, and we had a very explicit results for, for the Schwarzschild theory, um, which is nice because then you could, for example, study, uh, study these things much more cleanly. You can also think about um, this um, um, centaur geometry, which at, at asymptotically uh, in, the, in the asymptotic region has a, a so-called gamma Schwarzschild, which is a, just a slightly different form of the Schwarzschild theory. Um, but again, it's exactly solvable, and, and, and you, can, you, can, you can maybe implement this idea of cutting, dissecting the centaur in a very, uh, very concrete way. Um, yeah, so, so that, that studying a two-dimensional dissector is, is, is one of the outlooks, uh, I guess. Another one um, that, you, that you can consider is, is, is JT gravity at finite uh, cut off really defined through through this this flow. Um, and we've only shown this on shell, and um, I think there's 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 indications that this won't happen in in uh, at the quantum level, and and there needs to be an improvement uh, of that. Now maybe in quantum mechanics you're you're lucky, and 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 this improvement is is not that difficult. Um, one way to see that this is not gonna gonna work at finite cutoff, this cutoff surface that you usually draw in in JT, in this wiggly boundary, that could now like um, um, have a very wild pattern where it kind of uh, turns back and and goes back along the boundary, um, which in in the particular limit where you take it to infinity or is is suppressed. Um, but this is not the case when you do it at finite cutoff, so there's some subtleties there. Uh, of course, applications to, to particular other models, the SQK model or the D0 brain uh, quantum mechanics. It's also interesting to think about what this deformation um, corresponds to in this matrix model interpretation of JT gravity. What is the particular matrix model that, that corresponds to our um, deformation? It won't be quite the one that's considered by, by Douglas Stanford and uh, uh, Douglas Stanford, Steve Schenker, and, and Phil Saad. But, um, but yeah, maybe there's still something you can concrete you can think about. Um, and uh, another interesting point is uh, that I didn't touch up on uh, very, uh, very much is, is coupling to other types of gravity. Um, say the, the one example is the world line that I uh, mentioned briefly. Um, but you could consider other types of, of gravity theories and maybe you can learn about um, learn about those type of deformations in a more general uh, sense and help you understand uh, uh, gravity in some sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eric. <laughs> Um, we had quite a few questions already, but maybe if anyone has one final question, feel free to ask anyone from online. All right. Well, if there are no final questions, then let's thank you already again. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, it was fun doing it.